Hello, everyone, and welcome to the draft Snake River White Sturgeon Management Plan public open house. Um, thank you so much for taking some time out of your evening to uh, join us and have a discussion on, on Idaho sturgeon. Ben, if you could pull up the presentation. Still have the presenter view, Ben. All right, fantastic. All right, well, again, thanks for joining us, folks. Um, look forward to uh, a productive conversation with everyone this evening. Before we get into kind of the meat of our, our presentation, I wanna do just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, next slide, please. First and foremost, want to provide an opportunity for the Sturgeon management team from IDFG that are on the call this evening to introduce themselves so that everybody can put a face with the name and understand where uh, different folks are managing different fisheries. So I will start. My name is Brett Bowersox. I'm the native fish coordinator for IDFG and do a variety of work, including uh, work with white sturgeon. Martin, you can take it away next. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Koenig. I'm the sport fish program coordinator. I work here at the Boise headquarters office in our fisheries division and uh, working on a lot of different sport fisheries, West Slope Cutthroat, Yellowstone, but I also help out Brett on the sturgeon management plan as well. Joe Kozepka here. Uh, I oversee the management program from an administrative level. I'll leave it at that. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Dupont. I'm the Clearwater Region's fisheries manager. And as far as sturgeon go, I'm in charge of managing the sturgeon population in the Hell's Canyon reach. So that's from the Idaho-Washington border up to Hell's Canyon Dam, as well as the Lower Salmon River. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Art Butts. I'm the fish manager here in the southwest region uh, out of Nampa. And I help manage uh, the sturgeon from Brownlee Dam upstream to CJ Strike Reservoir, through Street CJ Strike Reservoir. I'm uh, Mike Peterson, uh, the fish manager in the Magic Valley region. <clears throat> I uh, manage sturgeon uh, fisheries from the upstream portion of CJ, so up to Bliss Dam. So the Bliss Reach, the Lower Salmon Reach, the Upper Salmon Reach, the Shoshone Falls Reach, as well as uh, the lower portion uh, upstream of Shoshone Falls from Minidoka Dam to Massacre Rocks. Hello everybody, my name is Pat Kennedy. I manage the fisheries from Massacre Rocks upstream to Gem Lake Dam. Great, thanks Pat. Um, yeah, and, and it's important to note that this this group is really the, the primary authors on the management plan that we're talking about this evening. So yeah, thanks everybody uh, from the IDFG end as well for participating. Next slide. So the way we're gonna go through the, the meeting here this evening is we are gonna lead in with a presentation and the sturgeon management plan contains a lot of great information and is an excellent summary of IDFG's white sturgeon program in the snake. But we certainly realize that it's also a, a pretty sizable document and um, we wanted to take an additional step to provide some, some public outreach, 
and an opportunity for dialogue back and forth regarding the plan. And that's, that's really why we put this meeting together. And um, yeah, through the presentation, we'll provide an overview of the new plan, hit some high points on a broad sense, and then also on the, the second part of the presentation, go into a little bit more detail on the reach management categories that are contained within the plan and kind of make up the second half of the plan. Then after that presentation is done, we're going to do a question and answer session. And you can be you know, writing a question at any point in the meeting. Uh, the way to do that is on the bottom of your, your Zoom window, click on the Q&A button highlighted on the slide here, type in your question, hit enter, and then that'll be sent to us where we can be um, keeping tabs on the questions that are coming in. And then when we get to this part of the, the meeting, we'll be asking those to the panel and fielding questions for, um, for the public. The last housekeeping item that I really do wanna mention is that it's important to note that this meeting is not the formal comment period. Uh, this is again, intended to be a way for uh, you folks to be learning about the Sturgeon plan and our program. And honestly, a way for us to be learning from the anglers and the public about what's on your minds with regards to Sturgeon. But in order to get your comments submitted, to be um, considered as part of the public review of the plan, please go to the website that's shown on the bottom of the slide, get in there, and then that is the place that you can submit your comments regarding the plan for us. So uh, next slide, perfect. Um, we'll start in now on the presentation and Martin Koenig is gonna provide the overview. Thanks, Brett. So for my portion of the presentation tonight, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the structure of the plan, a brief history of sturgeon management in Idaho, talk a little bit about the biology and life cycle of sturgeon and some of our current challenges to conserving and managing these fish. So the, the plan has three major structures, really, uh, three major sections. There's the goals, the introduction, and the reach management reports. The goal for the plan is pretty simple. We're gonna to try to manage sturgeon populations so that they're capable of providing sport fishing opportunity for now and into the future. In the introduction section, we're gonna talk about the species biology of, of sturgeon, the life cycle and limiting factors or what, what we might call threats, some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, we're also gonna introduce the idea of population targets or goals for these, each of the different sections of the river. And in the reach management plan section, this is a detailed description of each of the river sections. And it's a summary of past information and survey data that we have for these places. It also talks about the current population status of sturgeon in those reaches, but it also sets the management direction and conservation work that's coming up in the future. Next slide, please. So white sturgeon are famous for being the largest freshwater fish in North America. They have a very long lifespan, which allows them to reach those large sizes. It's not unusual for these fish to live 80 to 100 years old. And they also are very slow to reach sexual maturity. Most of them not spawning for the first time until you know 12 to 15 years old. They don't spawn every year either. So it's kind of infrequent and that makes these populations very susceptible to overfishing and slow to rebuild. White sturgeon are adapted to living in large interconnected river systems where they have access to a wide diversity of habitat types that allow them to fulfill their life cycle. And they need really high natural flows like spring floods to pull off a year class or um, spawn basically. They need high turbulent fast water for spawning in the spring. As far as water temperature goes, they like it a little bit, little bit warmer than trout, but not as warm as bass. So anywhere between 50 and 70 degrees. Next slide. Now, beginning in the 1880s, demand for sturgeon meat and caviar really spawned a huge commercial fishing industry throughout the Pacific Northwest and including Idaho. 
And by 1900, a lot of those commercial fisheries were already overfished and much of that commercial fishing collapsed. Idaho Department of Fishing Game was started in 1939 and commercial sturgeon fishing was banned shortly after in 1943. However, at that time, sport fishing harvest still continues up until 1948. There was a one fish per day bag limit. And then further restrictions started in 1956 and it went down to two fish per year because those stocks were still trying to be recovered. So just around the time that commercial fishing is ending, the era of dam building really starts to ramp up. And between 1950 and 1975, we see the construction of 12 Snake River dams. And those dams are really going to fuel the mining industry, uh, agriculture, population growth throughout the state. So at the same time that these sturgeon are recovering, we're seeing major changes to the habitat throughout the Snake River. And that's, as a result, in 1970, Sport fishing is, is regulated back to catch and release only, and we've been there ever since. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the current factors, some of the current factors that are limiting or threats facing sturgeon right now. Uh, the primary threat still continues to be dams on the Snake River, and dams break up these long river sections and into shorter sections and not all of the habitat types that sturgeon need to complete their life cycle are present in all of those sections. Uh, dams also alter the river flows by reducing flows typically, but we also see lower frequency of those high spring floods that sturgeon need to reproduce. And so we're seeing a lot less natural reproduction in the snake than we were historically. Uh, the other thing about uh, that we're seeing is we're having a lot of challenges with low water quality and poor water quality is coming from a multiple kinds of different pollution sources, including sedimentation, uh, excess nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and some really warm water temperatures. There's still a couple other question marks out there though, like the effect of non-native species like smallmouth bass or channel catfish their impact on sturgeon populations is really unknown. And when it comes to recreational fishing, it seems like sport fishing doesn't have much of an impact on sturgeon populations in most cases. However, there's still some questions regarding whether fishing is having impacts on populations in certain circumstances, such as you know poor water quality. Next slide. So the, the real important thing is that habitat conditions are driving sturgeon populations and they need very specific conditions in the river to actually be able to spawn successfully. And of the 10 reaches that we're gonna talk about today in the river, only two of those still have naturally reproducing populations. Those are the Hell's Canyon reach and the Bliss to CJ Strike reach. And if you look at this graph, this is river flow through 2017 in the springtime. Um, this was a particularly good year where we had a lot of spawning sturgeon. And during that time, the river spent a good chunk of the spring above that blue dotted line, which represents about 17,000 CFS. And it stood there for well over a month, which was great. And these are the kind of conditions that we really need. These same kind of spawning triggers are showing where there's evidence for this type of high flow event in Hell's Canyon as well that, that triggers spawning successfully. The other thing is that a lot of this, the survival of our sturgeon populations is affected by poor water quality. And we're just not seeing the same level of survival in the populations in those areas that we have low water quality. Uh, for example, the Swan Falls to Brownlee section of, of the Snake River it has some of the worst quality water quality. And subsequently we see the lowest survival in those sturgeon populations. Uh, we, we've had a history of fish kills down in Brownlee Reservoir in, in 1990, we saw about 28 dead sturgeon as a result of really high water temperatures, very low dissolved oxygen. And we saw similar conditions set up in CJ Strike Reservoir last August in 2022. And that prompted an emergency fishery closure on that section of the river. Next slide. So we talked about the long lifespan of sturgeon and 
that's related to the fact that they have very, very high survival rates uh, individually from year to year. So we have to be very careful about sport fish management because small changes in those annual survival rates can affect whether the population is increasing or decreasing. And since the last plan, uh, the Fish and Game Department conducted several st research studies looking at specific fishing impacts. And those focused on things like deep hooking, the type of hook used, whether it was a circle hook or a J hook. And then we looked at ingested tackle. So tackle that sturgeon would be sucking off of the bottom and then carrying around in their stomachs. And after x-raying and tagging hundreds of fish, it really showed that sport fishing had pretty minimal impact on, on most of these fish. And so some of the things we implemented as a result of this research were things like the sliding sinker rule and not we we did not end up mandating barbless um sorry circle hooks because circle hooks didn't really seem to reduce deep hooking and so right now it looked like sport fishing uh had pretty limited impact but granted this research was mostly done in hell's canyon and things could be a little bit different in some of our really uh high use fisheries like cj strike tail race for example where things might be a little bit different and the plan is really going to focus looking into uh, quantifying how much angler effort is out there. We think that sturgeon fishing has gotten more popular, but we don't have good information to quantify that. So creel census is really going to be a focus of the plan moving forward, as well as looking at specific sport fishing impacts uh, in periods of poor water quality. Next slide, please. So when it comes to monitoring the status of our sturgeon populations, a lot of this work is done by Idaho Power Company, and they do a really good job as part of their mitigation efforts to keep track of how many fish are out there, what their growth rates are like, their maturity rates. And the river populations are sampled on very specific intervals. So everything from the Brownlee Oxbow Hell's Canyon complex down is surveyed on a 10 year rotation and all of the reaches between uh, Brownlee and Shoshone Falls, that metal snake reach, those are all sampled on a five-year interval. Now, above Shoshone Falls, in that non-native section from American Falls to Idaho Falls, that section does not have regularly monitored surveys out there, but we are working on getting a better population estimate for that section currently. And these Surveys collect data on counts and size distribution, and they're pretty important in setting our population objectives as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those population targets here now. Next slide, please. So this plan is a little bit different than our last plan in that it established new specific population targets for each reach. In this graph, the population targets that are proposed are in the green bars. And the blue bars show the latest population estimate from the survey data. And these targets are set based on the densities of fish that we see in the Bliss to CJ Strike Reservoir section. That's a model that we're using to estimate the, the capacity of these other reaches because it's one of our healthiest populations. And we're applying those densities to the habitat available in these other stretches to estimate these population targets. So as you can see, most of the reaches are not currently meeting their population targets. We have to keep in mind that's largely because of a long history of no natural spawning in those areas. And Brett's going to talk a little bit more about how we propose to meet some of those population targets uh, during his section in the reach management plan section. Next slide, please. So since our last plan came out in 2008, the need for stocking sturgeon has become a lot more apparent since that original plan was released. And Idaho Fishing Game is working closely with Idaho Power Company, and they've been developing this new uh, conservation aquaculture or repatriation program, we call it, where we've been developing new fish culture and stocking techniques that minimize the risk to wild spawning populations. And the whole core concept of this program really relies on collecting wild eggs from naturally spawning fish from the Snake River. 
Uh, these fish are all collected, sorry, the eggs are all collected from the Bliss Reach. Uh, we then transfer them to a hatchery where we raise them out for about a year. And then those fish are stocked back into the Snake River at about 12 inches long. Now, uh, next slide, please. We've been pretty consistently stocking since about 2015. Uh, but the numbers of fish that we can stock vary from year to year, depending on the river condition, um, water temperatures, and survival rates in the hatchery. Uh, but we are seeing better success in our fish culture techniques, and we're learning more about how to grow these fish in a hatchery every year. Because uh, it turns out these things are very tricky to raise in a hatchery. So far, we've raised, uh, we've collected about 83,000 eggs to date and stocked over 6,100 sturgeon. Most of these fish go into the Snake River below CJ Strike and Swan Falls. However, we're also stocking fish in the Twin Falls Reach. And this program is also the source of fish that are, will be stocked in the non native reaches from American Falls to Idaho Falls as well. Next slide. Given that the numbers of eggs and larvae that we collect varies each year, we need to prioritize these precious fish that we have and, and really stock them in um, the best places possible. So the first priority is to stock these fish within the native range in reaches that are not reproducing successfully on their own, and then have good survival. So those are places like the CJ Strike Tail Race, Twin Falls, Hagerman, those areas. The second priority is places within the native range that maybe have a little bit lower survival, but still need a lot of help. Think of like Swan Falls to Brownlee section in there. And then our final priority for these fish would be to stock the non-native range in the sport fishing sections between American Falls and Idaho Falls to provide that fishing opportunity in the upper Snake River, but keep those populations as genetically similar to all of the rest of the wild sturgeon lower down in the Snake River. And with that, I'll pass it over to Brett Bowersox. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate the overview. I'm going to jump into the more focused reach management section of our presentation. And the plan does divide the Snake River in Idaho into 10 total reaches. And in general, the boundaries of these reaches are the main stem dams. The most downstream being Lower Granite Dam, which is actually in the state of Washington, but is the boundary of the Hell's Canyon Reach. And then all the way up to slightly upstream of the city of Idaho Falls. The 10 reaches within the plan are then divided into three different management categories those being core wild, stocked, and non-native range. Next slide. We will start with uh, some additional information on core wild reaches. Uh, there are two of these are Lower Granite to Hell's Canyon and CJ Strike to Bliss. Next. So abundance of sturgeon within the wild core reaches is is maintained through natural recruitment. So Martin spent time talking through some of those environmental characteristics that are needed to allow natural recruitment to occur. These are the two reaches that have that suite uh, of, of conditions. So because we have natural recruitment occurring, we have tracked stable abundance within these two reaches since the first surveys were conducted back in the early 1980s. In the CJ Strike to Bliss Dam, uh, the first five surveys that were conducted actually showed kind of a, an, an increasing trend over time, with the last survey done in 2021 being the first dip that we saw within that population. But certainly, again, overall a stable trend. The stable trend held true uh, in the Lower Granite Dam to Hell's Canyon Dam surveys that have been done over the last um, number of years. But there, the last survey was done in 2014 and 2015. But fortunately, we have uh, a new survey occurring next year in 2024 and then again in 2025 to get updated information in Hell's Canyon that will continue to inform our management strategies within that reach. So on that management strategy end of things, the priority here is to not do stocking and instead of stocking protect habitat 
and water quality characteristics that are already occurring within these reaches to help maintain the natural recruitment that is occurring there. With regards to recreation, the plan proposes to maintain the catch and release angling opportunity that exists there. Next slide. Just because these wild core reaches are the healthiest reaches that we have in the Snake River in Idaho, that does not mean that there's not work to be done to help maintain that status. So with regards to maintaining abundance, there's two objectives or objective types in the plan. The first being translocation. In both of these reaches, we have tagged many of the sturgeon that occur within them so that we're able to track their movement and see where they go within the reach. But it's also provided us the opportunity to detect when fish from these reaches show up downstream in other reaches. So the plan proposes that whenever we do detect a fish from one of these two reaches showing up downstream, that we have the ability to translocate those individuals back up into the wild core reaches as a way to help maintain abundance. And then with regards to recruitment, uh, this is more specific to the Hell's Canyon reach, but work that we've done over the last 10 years or so since the last plan was written has really highlighted a couple question marks with regards to recruitment in Hell's Canyon. The first being growth. Uh, the sturgeon population within Hell's Canyon grows the slowest of any Snake River sturgeon reach. Um, the growth in Hell's Canyon is, is so slow that we actually, uh, as we've gotten a better understanding of the growth occurring there, have some concern that small individuals currently existing within the river area of Hell's Canyon may be growing so slowly that they do not reach spawning sizes by the time that they're subject to mortality. So the last couple of years, we have started a study which collected some of the small juvenile sturgeon from the river section of Hell's Canyon and moved them down into Lower Granite Reservoir, where we've documented much higher growth rates in the hopes that by doing this, those fish will be able to grow faster and reach spawning sizes and again, help maintain the abundance within Hell's Canyon. Another question mark and an area of interest within Hell's Canyon is regarding juvenile survival. While we have been able to document regular spawning events in the form of collecting eggs from spawning occurring on an annual basis, what we've seen much more sporadically is the recruitment of age zero or age one juvenile sturgeon from those annual spawning events. So here again, we're currently and propose to continue in the future, work to evaluate juvenile survival and get a better handle on if there's any management action that could help uh, promote additional recruitment of juveniles into this reach. For both of these reaches, water management is a big deal. As, well, as Martin mentioned in his presentation, hitting those spawning flow triggers is what really helps establish natural recruitment occurring within these reaches and getting eggs to be deposited. So we've identified uh, maintaining spawning flows or identifying specific spawning flows within Hell's Canyon that help uh, increase the amount of natural rec recruitment occurring in both of these reaches as a management priority. And then lastly, specific to the Bliss Reach, there's a desire to establish a minimum population target. So in all reaches within the plan, there is an adult population target, which kind of represents where we want to get with regards to adult sturgeon abundance. But because Bliss Reach is such an important reach with regards to supplying those wild eggs that are then used in the hatchery program to be building up other reaches in the mid snake, um, we want to establish a minimum population target where if we would hit that lower population target, we would explore other management strategies to help boost this population back up. Next slide. The next management category are the stocked reaches, and this is the most represented category within the plan. Next slide. The 
Surge in abundance within stocked reaches is not maintained by natural recruitment. One of those or a couple of those environmental characteristics that are needed for spawning and rearing and growth up to adult sizes is, is, is absent within these reaches now. And that has resulted in uh, kind of some different trends depending on the reach. We do have some uh, trends within these reaches that are stable, and we have some that are still decreasing, even under uh, a stocked scenario. And it's important to note that on these two charts that are shown on this slide, for Swan Falls Dam to CJ Strike and Bliss Dam to Lower Salmon Falls, there is there are hatchery fish starting to recruit into these population surveys during the latter portion of the data series. So with Swan Falls, you can see a pretty steady decline during the first four surveys. But in the last survey, there was a slight uptick in the actual kind of overall abundance of stur sturgeon within the reach. And this is because some of these hatchery releases are beginning to recruit into these stocks. So the management strategy here is to continue to stock these reaches to reach the population targets that are outlined within the plan. And with regards to recreation, continue the catch and release angling uh, opportunity. Next slide. It's important to point out a couple considerations regarding the stocking strategies that are uh, in the plan for each of these reaches. First and foremost, it's going to take a while. Uh, we began stocking with the repatriation program that Martin mentioned back in 2015, 2016. And as we began the stocking process, we set up a strategy that estimated the number of juvenile fish that we would need to put into the reach to then eventually reach our adult sturgeon abundance goal. But that timeline will take 50 years of stocking to actually reach those goals. So it'll be implemented during this plan and future sturgeon management plans over that timeline. And it's also important to remember that as we're learning more about the stocking and the hatchery program, we'll be continuing to evaluate the survival of juvenile sturgeon releases in these different reaches and adjusting as we learn more. And then lastly, although stocking is the current priority for reaching adult abundance targets in these reaches, we do want to continue to assess environmental limitations that are limiting natural recruitment currently so that in the future, whether it's wild fish that have remained in these reaches or the hatchery fish that are now being put in these reaches, that they will be able to spawn naturally and help build these populations back up. Next slide. Okay, the final management category is the non-native range and the single reach in this category is from Shoshone Falls to Idaho Falls. Next slide. So the abundance or really the, the first existence of sturgeon above Shoshone Falls occurred in the mid 1990s when we began stocking in this reach. And since that time, uh, we have done fairly minimal surveys of the sturgeon that have been stocked up there until more recently. But with those recent surveys, we have not documented any known natural spawning occurring uh, in the non-native reach. In addition, the abundance of sturgeon is currently unknown within the non-native reach. But we do know that stocked sturgeon are certainly surviving at some level because of the growing popularity of the sturgeon fishery that's occurring there. And the fish pictured on this slide is an example of the type of quality sturgeon that are available in this reach. This particular fish was captured and surveyed below American Falls Dam. So the management strategy here is to continue to maintain stocking, but it's important to remember that stocking priority that Martin mentioned this reach is the lowest stocking priority. So stocking here will be contingent on meeting the stocking goals and the stocking allocations of the reaches within native range, and then having the ability to stock this non-native range. With regards to recreation, this fishery is currently managed as a catch and release angling opportunity. 
but in the past few years, we have received a number of comments and questions from anglers if we could provide a harvest opportunity on sturgeon. And there may be some additional flexibility with this sturgeon because it is non-native range, because it is completely hatchery supported. Harvest could be an opportunity. And honestly, that is where a lot of our more recent survey work has um, been geared and focused in this reach. Next slide. So in 2021, Idaho Fish and Game began its first intensive survey work of white sturgeon above Shoshone Falls. And at the close of our work up there, we realized that continued work in there could be an excellent opportunity for partnership and collaboration with the University of Idaho and getting a graduate research project going to assess some of the questions that we have regarding the sturgeon population above Shoshone Falls. So if you've been out fishing on the river over the last couple of years, it's likely that you've seen the U of I crew out there doing their work. And what they are focused on is getting an estimate of abundance for areas uh, of the non-native reach above Shoshone Falls, looking at growth of sturgeon, monitoring movement of sturgeon, using tagging to help us establish what kind of stocking rates we need up in this reach to not only maintain the catch and release fishery, but also explore the potential harvest fishery idea. The U of I work is scheduled to be completed this coming year. And as we get findings from their work, we'll be using that to kind of make a determination whether or not harvest could be um, something that's explored in the reach above Shoshone Falls. And if we think it's a possibility, we would be reaching back out to the public to gauge their level of interest and get public uh, input regarding if establishing some level of harvest is of interest or if maintaining the catch and release fishery as it is, is a more preferred option. So bottom line, more to come regarding the non-native range and uh, the fishery up there. Next slide. Okay. That is the end of the presentation that we have for you folks this evening. So we'll move into the question and answer portion of the meeting. And again, or lastly, I'll remind folks to use that Q&A button as part of the Zoom meeting to submit your questions. All right, so uh, we have one question already. Uh, it's come from Jeff, and for the audience here, I'm going to read the question. It says, do you see sturgeon fishing going to a tag-like system where anglers would be limited on number of sturgeon caught? Um, so, Jeff, uh, the question here is basically getting at whether or not we would go to any sort of limited entry type system. And... Um, I guess I'm gonna sort of flip that question in my answer here. How we would approach that is, if we were ever to determine that fishing caused mortality was a problem in a reach, we would look at how many sturgeon are being caught, what's the catch frequency, like how many anglers are out there, how many are they catching per year, and we would combine all those sorts of information uh, to, to formulate a response on how you might alter the season structure there. So there's a lot of different ways to sort of reduce fishing mortality for sturgeon if it was deemed to be a problem. You could limit fishing areas. You could limit the number of rods that anglers are allowed to use. You could shorten a season to only allow fishing effort a couple months a year. Um, or you could go with something that's suggested like that. You could do a mandatory catch limit. However, I would say that would probably be relatively difficult because sturgeon fishing occurs in remote areas. You'd, people would have to validate any sort of permit like that. And then our officers would have to be checking to make sure that people were properly, properly validating permits. So uh, it's an interesting thought there. And that could be one of the options that we 
would consider if a, a season structure change was needed. Okay. Awesome. We got another question here from Paul and Caleb. Um, how can local anglers help with research on the non-native stretches of the snake? Uh, any of you guys want to tackle that one? Um, since we've got Pat Kennedy on, who's the manager up there, Pat, you want to tackle that? Yeah, sure. Um, we have conducted a citizen science program in the past where we passed out uh, pit tag scanners. Um, we had mixed success with that. Those scanners are really expensive, um, not very robust to, to some of the sturgeon fishing activities. Uh, that's still potential, potentially an opportunity. Um, but I, I would suggest, uh, you know, reach out to us here in the Southeast region. Um, give me a call. We can talk about opportunities. Most of our resources are tied up with the University of Idaho graduate study right now, but in the future, there might be opportunities to engage. Very good. Um, we have another question here uh, from the Q&A. Um, Castor BS. How does the Salmon River subbasin factor into your statewide plan for sturgeon management, especially in the terms of recovery in the upper Salmon River above Corn Creek? Joe Dupont, would you take that one, please? Well, seeing Corn Creek is above my region, uh, I might be a little sketchy on the response here, but um, based on work we've seen so far in the Salmon River, the densities of fish is pretty, pretty low. In fact, once you drop below Riggins, um, or once you go get above Riggins, we don't see a whole lot of fish. Occasionally you see them up around salmon. We've seen them in the middle fork, but in reality, the abundances are low, so they don't play a big role in um, management. Another thing that we've seen is it looks like um, there's not a lot of juveniles. What happens is, what we think happens is we know they're spawning there. They spawn, the larval drifts out of the system, and then the juveniles rear in the Hell's Canyon, and then some of them then migrate back up and live their life in the salmon and spawn. So as far as above Corn Creek goes, it's not a real big factor because we really don't think that it's going to provide, a, a, I guess, or has a lot of potential to provide a lot of abundance in the future. If I could add there a little bit, Joe. Um, Absolutely. You know, I guess with one, in one regard, uh, just, you know, with regard to the term recovery, you know, we're not really working towards recovery of, of white sturgeon in the salmon or in the snake, but we are trying to get to adult population abundance targets um, that we showed there. And just with regard to structure of the plan, the salmon is rolled into the Hell's Canyon reach. So um, if you do have, you know, questions of how we um, presented the information on the lower salmon, uh, that would be the place to look. And um, that reach would be rolled into the adult abundance target for Hell's Canyon, because those are all connected there's no um you know impediment for sturgeon between the snake and the salmon there awesome we got another question here from paul and caleb uh how do the populations of st sturgeon compare in tail races versus other portions of the river um martin do you want to take that one yeah sure uh, so when it comes to the tail race portions, there's two things we really need to consider. Um, the stretches from Swan Falls to Brownlee, CJ Strike to Swan Falls, and a lot of those like Hagerman reaches, except for the CJ, uh, sorry, except for the Swan Falls to Brownlee section, which is actually the longest section in, in these tail race areas. Most of those sections are super short. So just by the nature of the fact that they're short, there's not a ton of habitat there. And secondly, a lot of that habitat does not support natural reproduction. And so the populations in those tail race sections are actually pretty small numbers of sturgeon. I think in the latest CJ Strike 
population that was around 240, 250. Uh, some of those Twin Falls, uh, Hagerman areas, I think the populations are in the 50 to a couple hundred fish. When we compare that to the naturally reproducing sections, which are much longer and have much better habitat, we're talking about populations that are in the thousands. I think the Bliss Reach population has over 2,000 fish in it that are greater than, uh, uh, what is it, 60 centimeters long? So about greater than three feet or so. So yeah, those the Hell's Canyon population, I believe, also is is pretty robust. I think it's in like the 1,500. Um, let me check out my cheat sheet here. Yeah, I, I think it's in that like 1,500 area as well. So yeah, the populations in those longer reaches where we see natural spawning are, are quite a bit bigger, but some of those tail race sections, the populations are, are in the hundreds of individuals, not in the thousands. I'll, I'll go ahead and add a little bit to that, Martin. Um, yeah, please. Some of those tail race um, areas provide, you know, uh, some of the only bank fishing opportunities, at least within the Magic Valley regions. Um, they also have some of the highest uh, angler effort um, that we see up and down the river. Um, we do see a fair number of fish hang out in those tail race areas, just uh, likely due to some of the water quality uh, things that we discussed earlier, uh, typically cooler water coming out of the bottom of the dam. Um, so definitely during summertime, we'll see some fish um, move into those tail race areas. Um, different times of the year though, like Martin was saying, they'll definitely spread out uh, among those reaches. Excellent. Um, we'll switch over here to some online questions. Uh, so have you guys surveyed sturgeon in Snake River reservoirs? Would anyone like to tackle that one? I, uh, I can I can jump on that one, Connor. Um, okay. the, the short answer is yes, that we have surveyed in the reservoir systems as well as, you know, as noted in the river systems. Um, interestingly, in a number of the reservoir systems, we see very, very little use by sturgeon, but in a couple, we do see uh, quite a bit of use actually and it seems to be more in those core wild reaches of um, CJ Strike to Bliss and the Hell's Canyon reach where we do definitely see um, sturgeon using them. But I, I guess I'll add, and Joe, you can, Joe DuPont, you can add to my, uh, what I say here if you want, but certainly in, in the Hell's Canyon reach, um, while we are, and you know, mentioned moving some fish down from the river into lower granite reservoir to try and improve gro uh, growth. Um, it's it seems like the reservoir is being a little bit underutilized compared to what we would expect. So um, that is a place where we're hoping we can get closer to some of those ab adult abundance targets is uh, through increasing abundance in lower granite reservoir. Yeah, Brad, I can add to that too. So as far as how do we sample in the reservoirs, I could tell you in, in the lower granite reservoir, Idaho Power does annual gill netting. They have gill net mesh sizes that specifically targets smaller fish. And so we use that sampling to evaluate uh, how recruitment is doing. Um, they have also set lines throughout the, the reservoir. Um, you can use different size hooks, lines, and baits to target big fish or little fish. Um, those are the typical techniques. There uh, is some rod and reel sampling as well, where you um, using certain depth finders, you can actually target fish and catch them. As far as the, why do we think more fish can um, live in the lower granite pool? And the reason is previous samples in reservoirs down river and the snake. So there's three other reservoirs down there. They've all seen a fair bit higher densities in there um, that shows that these reservoirs can support higher numbers. And, and that is why we think that reservoir is underseeded. All right. 
Uh, I got another question here while we're on the, the topic of, um, of alternative water bodies. Uh, do sturgeon use the clear water or salmon rivers? I guess I'll take that one on too. Sounds good. Go All right, it. so we talked a little bit briefly about the salmon river and I'll just mention that um, densities are are much lower in the salmon river than the snake. They do use it and we've seen them as far upstream as the town of salmon and up the middle fork. But as far as uh, population where there's a bunch of small fish and then a, uh, a gradient of sizes, we don't really see that. Um, and then as far as the Clearwater goes, we talked to some of the tribal members whose parents once fished uh, the Clearwater. There used to be high densities in certain areas. However, once lower, once uh, Warshak Dam went in place, they now release really cold water. And we think this water is so cold that it really doesn't uh, provide the ideal growing conditions. And, and we really don't see sturgeon anymore in the clear water. I suspect there's a few that stray up there, but not many. All right, we got another question from Jeff. Um, does Idaho Fish and Game share and receive information from neighboring states? Mike, you're shaking your head. Do you wanna take that one on? <laughs> uh, sure, I can start into it, but there's probably others that can add uh, okay. more, but we do collaborate with other states uh, and uh, agencies um, for a variety of different research projects. Um, you know, once once a year, um, several agencies get together and talk about different uh, surgeon, sturgeon research projects. Um, this last year, we did it in, in Hell's Canyon. That was some of the video footage that folks were seeing when we're, we were trying to collect some fish uh, from further up in the canyon and move those down into the reservoir to monitor the different growth rates. Um, but we certainly do work with Washington, Oregon, uh, several of the other tribes, uh, the, the Nez Perce tribe, the Kootenai um, tribe of Idaho as well. And I'll let anybody else, if there's anything to add to that. I would just add that, that anybody involved in sturgeon research in the Columbia Basin, we're fairly connected with, and, and we all talk together and we all share data back and forth. So um, we're all trying to understand sturgeon better ourselves and we regularly share information back and forth to, to help that process. Got it. Um, here's a question for Art. Um... Does Idaho Fish and Game expect to have to do any fishery closures similar to what happened last year at CJ Strike? Hi. Well, I guess the quick answer would be we sure hope not. Um, last year was a pretty uh, severe summer in terms of temperature and what we were seeing with water temperature and uh, dissolved oxygen. Uh, it was those conditions were pretty tough in the snake arm of the CJ Strike River uh, CJ strike snake arm and they were up further upstream than what we've ever documented or Idaho powers documented. Um, we've never seen the level of mortality that we saw last year. Uh, we have been in response to that because of the numbers, because this population is so valuable. We, we did what was called a conservation closure, emergency conservation closure, last year uh, and as part of that we committed to uh, studying this situation as far as uh, uh, mortality as it relates to angling and environmental conditions in CJ Strike Reservoir and so we've launched a pretty in-depth study that began in April and we've been uh, I'm sure most sturgeon anglers have seen us and met with us out there uh, over the past several months um, but we've been out there quite a bit. We're uh, acoustic telemetry uh, marking fish. We're uh, uh, interacting with anglers and we're also doing mortality surveys. And we're only seeing, we haven't, 
we've we've seen i think about three sturgeon this summer um that that uh have been uh i guess dead and we haven't necessarily been able to relate it to any specific condition uh or or uh cause of mortality anyway so we will be following that we're going to be trying to learn what we can uh on that and and i hope that the the situation we saw last year is is uh not something we have to visit again All right, we got another question here from Castor BS. Um, so far that historic photos in the Limhigh County Museum provide evidence of six to seven foot long sturgeon being historically caught as far upstream as the town of Salmon. And in recent years, sturgeon around three feet in length have been caught as far upstream as McKim Creek, uh, about halfway to Chalice. So would Fish and Game be receptive to initiating a sturgeon recovery program in this upper salmon? If not, why is the sub-basin excluded from the statewide goals and objectives? Uh, Brett or Joe, do either of you guys want to take yeah, that one? So I guess I'll tackle one. I, I have to admit that's something we did not talk about or consider. Um, we do not have historical population information from that area of the Salmon R River. There simply weren't any population surveys done um, prior to reductions in populations. We assume that they were relatively um, low abundance up there. And we, we think that sturgeon use it as they do today. We think that lower Salmon River sturgeon occasionally make seasonal migrations upriver to take advantage of maybe food resources up there. So um, to think, I guess I don't think that we could specifically establish a population that could live year round in the upper Salmon River. It's just not the habitat type, nor is it sort of the temperature regime that sturgeon need to sort of live through all of their life stages. What I think could benefit and lead to occasionally a few more salmon in that area would be to work on the population in uh, the Lower Snake below Hell's Canyon, which is connected with the Lower Salmon River, and hope by rebuilding those populations that you'd occasionally see more sturgeon util utilizing upstream areas of the Salmon River. And I'll just add to Joe's comments that I believe it was 2018. Um, I can't remember if, um, with regards to the question of below Corn Creek as well, um, we did do some sturgeon survey work on the main salmon and were unable to, between corn and vinegar, unable to collect any then. Um, I believe there's a plan to do some surveys in there next year uh, to look for sturgeon as well. So to Joe's point of it not, uh, I guess, it being on the, the periphery of where sturgeon are currently, even though, yes, as um, you mentioned in the question, there's been observations occasionally in the middle fork um, and up upstream up above the town of salmon um, that is referenced that those observations have occurred but just doesn't set up for a you know a robust sturgeon population with the habitat and and conditions that are in a lot of those places but we'll keep an eye out if sturgeon are showing up more often Awesome. We got another question uh, from our attendees. Uh, this one's from Cody. What is the estimated population below Jim Lake? Do we have any estimates? And uh, Mike or Patrick, do you guys want to address that one? Yeah, I could jump in here. Um, we don't currently have an esti estimate. Uh, I think uh, that University of Idaho graduate research is still working to generate that estimate through recaptures. 
All right. Uh, question here from Brett Jones. What are the plans to increase water quality conditions throughout the state of Idaho? Okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that one, Brett. Um, uh, I guess Idaho Fish and Game really does not have management responsibility or authority for water quality. Um, water quality is primarily managed through Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Um, there are efforts in the state to improve um, water quality. I really can't speak to the specific specifics of those. I would say that there's um, every year in early February, there's a water quality summit in Boise that shares a lot of the activities that are going on uh, throughout the state to improve water quality. And then uh, maybe the only other thing I would add to that one is that with Hell's Canyon relicensing, if and when that comes about, there's, um, there is supposed to be funding associated with that that is, that's like one of the primary um, objectives that will be completed from the mitigation package that's associated with Hell's Canyon relicensing is to work on water quality improvements throughout the state. And then um, there has been, I think, a recognition more recently at the state level that there are water quality problems in the state. They're, they're causing some of the harmful algal blooms. They're also causing problems with well water in some situations. And so there's a recognition that that needs to be tackled. Again, Idaho Fish and Game is not um, sort of the primary entity responsible for working on water quality, though recognizing that it does affect our fisheries and fish populations throughout the state. All righty, that's looks like all of our questions from our attendees. Um, thank you, everybody, for submitting some questions. Turn it back over to you, Brett. Sure. Thanks, Connor. Um, yeah, in closing, just want to uh, thank everybody that has attended and appreciate you taking the time to ask questions and engage with us on this additional step in the management plan review and, and public process. Please, as a reminder, uh, well, as a reminder, this presentation will be up online where you can access that web address for going in and submitting your formal comments on the plan. And otherwise, have a good evening. Thank you very much.